All right, uh, everybody, welcome. Um, today we are doing an engineering and life presentation um, with Altaf, uh, who is a pipeline engineer. Um, this is, I believe, episode five in our series. Um, and uh, we are welcoming uh, questions in the chat. Um, I will read them out uh, and um, I think you can also unmute yourself, but if you feel more comfortable, um, please uh, go ahead and, and type those in the chat. Um, we are always looking for um, more presenters. So if you want to do one of these presentations yourself, please let one of the mods know. Um, and uh, let's see, am I missing anything? I think. Um, Oh yeah, yeah, and this uh, is going to be recorded um, and uploaded to our YouTube channel. So um, if somebody can't make it, uh, hopefully they can, you know, watch uh, later. And um, yeah, I think I think that's it. Go ahead and uh, let's let's start. All right then. Um, you want to just go to the next slide and we get on with the agenda. So. Um, I'm going to start off with the introduction, and then um, Sam requested that I speak a little bit about my uh, undergrad program. <clears throat> and then I'm going to talk about my place of employment. Uh, we're not now called uh, Genesis Energies. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit about my job, and then how it was uh, coming in as a fresh graduate. And then uh, I'm going to uh, give you a few, a few things, a few pointers on uh, how to do your job search. You know, things that worked out for me. All right then. Um, so let's start with the introduction. Uh, Emily, if you could go to the next slide. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I graduated from uh, University of Houston. I did a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering and Technology. I graduated a little more than two years ago, uh, May 2019. Um, right now, I'm pursuing my Master of Science in Mechanical Engineering at Auburn University. Um, and um, I also got my EIT certificate, engineer in training certificate, um, back in May, 2020. Um, <clears throat> and while I was a undergrad student, um, I was part of a student organization called SME. Uh, SME is a Society of Manufacturing Engineers, but we had a student chapter at the University of Houston. Um, so I started off as a member and then made my way uh, uh, to being an officer. Um, and it had its perks, uh, you know, while I was in the university, it helped, helped me quite a bit with my job search. I'll uh, get into a, uh, get into it. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Um, I'll get into that a little more uh, later on. Um, and uh, right now, like I said, I'm uh, working as a pipeline engineer at uh, Genesis Energy. I've been working there uh, since August 2019. It's going to be exactly two years in uh, four days uh, um, and it's I've seen uh, quite a bit of uh, ups and downs well uh, more than half my career as a pipeline engineer has been during this pandemic uh, so you know I'll share a few experiences from uh, from that as well going forward um, Emily next slide please yeah so um, my undergrad program um, is uh, the mechanical engineering technology um, so it is a bet certified like uh, most engineering programs here in the US. Um, so this program, it includes, it's directed at both uh, computer aided design and computer aided manufacturing uh, like most uh, mechanical engineering programs. Um, <clears throat> but the difference between this program and the traditional mechanical engineering program is that this was more hands on. Um, we would spend more time in the lab uh, and when I say lab, not just, you know, uh, where would, we would do testing, but also computer labs where, you know, where they, uh, you know, taught us how to use software and actually uh, helped us, uh, you know, apply whatever we did in a class onto uh, computer simulations. Because, uh, and I think that's really important because, you know, uh, uh, today, uh, you know, when we are out in the uh, field, we're, um, you know, simulating different problems on software and, you know, uh, we need to have that skill set, you know, to be able to uh, pick up whatever we learn in class and then apply that on software. 
Um, so we, we actually did that on a whole bunch of software. Um, so especially when I was doing my dynamics and my uh, uh, dynamics and my computer design class, I remember my, this professor, uh, he would give us one problem every week and he would want it to, uh, he would want us to solve it on, uh, you know, create a parametric. He would want us to solve it on SolidWorks, Ansys Workbench, and then he would ask us to uh, replicate the results on MathCAD. Um, and then obviously there was, you know, hand calculations involved as well. Um, so we did that. We, did, we used to do the same problem five times every week. <laughs> um, so I think that was, uh, you know, obviously we as students, we hated that in the moment, but I think, uh, you know, now that I'm a working individual, I feel like that was uh, really helpful. Um, and then uh, um, my program also did offer electives in uh, oil and gas, and that's uh, the industry I am in right now. So four of the classes that were there in the program were uh, fundamentals of offshore systems, fundamentals of uh, pipeline systems, uh, valve design and drilling technology. So um, I did take offshore systems in which uh, they uh, really taught us about FPSOs. Uh, the full form of FPSO is folding, production, uh, storage, uh, and uh, offloading. Uh, so uh, their uh, facilities that are that actually float on uh, uh, at the sea level, uh, you know, and they have. I'm sorry. Is uh, is there a question? Um, no, I think that was just some background noise from someone who just joined. Okay. Um. <clears throat> anyway, um. Yeah. So they used to teach that class uh, taught us about uh the uh, offshore facilities that, you know, uh, did some processing on the uh, oil that would be uh, uh, produced from the wells that are on the seabed. Um, so, and in that class, we also learned how to uh, use OrcaFlex a little bit because um, that's a software that helps us design risers. Uh, risers are the pipeline section that go from the uh, top site facility to the seabed. Um, and then pipeline systems uh, was another class that was uh, teaching us how to design pipelines that are actually on the seabed um, and that transport oil from the oil fields to the uh, um, to onshore. Um, they are they're called um, export lines. Um, so we did a little, we just like did a little bit of a touch up. It was only an introductory class. We didn't go too much into detail. Um, but uh, that was a really good uh, class to take. Um, and then uh, valve design, this was a class I thought, you know, being here in Houston, I thought might have been really useful because there's a lot of uh, valve uh, manufacturing companies out here. And uh, I thought about taking valve design would have been really good for my job search. But unfortunately, I was uh, on the timeline to graduate and I couldn't take that class. But um, I have a few, quite a few friends who've taken this class and they said this class was really useful. Um, so, um, the pipeline systems class, you know, uh, when I was taking it, um, the professor I thought in the moment was, uh, being a little smug, um, uh, you know, uh, because he would keep saying that, you know, this class has actually helped students, uh, get jobs. I know he would teach us how to do pipeline design on MathCAD and all the calculations would be on MathCAD. Um, and uh, in the moment, I thought, you know, just learning uh, MathCAD and, you know, doing this one class isn't going to get me a job. And surprisingly, it did. Um, and I ended up becoming a pipeline engineer. And, uh, you know, uh, when I uh, went for this uh, interview, I actually took uh, some of my assignments, uh, you know, some of my homework from this class and I presented to them, uh, the interviewers and they actually saw some of it and, you know, they were impressed that, you know, I already was aware of some of these things. Um, and, and, you know, they, they knew that I probably wouldn't have to be trained as much. Uh, I don't know. I just, <clears throat> in the end, uh, you know, I felt like this class actually did help me uh, get a job. Um, although, um, you know, uh, what I did in the class, like I said, was only, uh, uh, this was, this class was just an introductory class. So, uh, you know, uh, what I did in this class is only a small portion of what I do. 
um, there, there's a lot more that goes into uh, pipeline design, and um, I'll get a little more into that uh, later on. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, like I said earlier, this uh, my uh, mechanical engineering technology program also had a few uh, manufacturing related courses. You know, we had a course in uh, quality control, um, and there was uh, courses in manufacturing systems, uh, automation, um, where they would teach us uh, uh, and how to use uh, different manufacturing techniques, lean methods, Six Sigma, and all of those things. So <clears throat> if you're someone who's uh, you know interested in manufacturing, uh, this course uh, here at uh, University of Houston is also something that would set you up for that. Um, can we move, move to the next slide, please? So um, right now uh, I'm working at Genesis Energies. So a little bit of the a little bit of history um, uh, about Genesis Energies is um, so. First of all, uh, before I get into that, uh, we're actually a client-based organizations in that um, companies like BP or Shell, you know, uh, when they are in need of producing oil from an oil field, they'll they'll approach us and. Uh, They'll ask us to uh, consult on uh, the designs that go into the various, you know, infrastructure that comes in. Um, um, you know, uh, whether it's uh, you know infrastructure on the seabed, whether it's the pipeline itself, <clears throat> and we help them with the design. And then once we're done with the design, we pass it on to a, uh, another company. Uh, we call them EPCI, and they will come in and uh, uh, perform the uh, installation and construction on the on the oil field, <clears throat> um, but um, you know, as we are moving towards uh, alternate energy, um, Genesis is also looking into energy transition, and you know, uh, uh, so we're not just doing oil and gas lately, but we're also, uh, uh, I think, a lot of research is going on with uh, 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 with offshore windmill. <clears throat> So we're uh, we're uh, looking into winning projects on that as well, um, but right now we're mainly concentrated towards uh, oil and gas. <clears throat> so uh, Genesis was uh, created back in 1988, uh, and then uh, you know, and then we were uh, Genesis was a small engineering house, you know, um, and it started off in uh, London and Aberdeen. Um, and then eventually, you know, uh, other disciplines start, started on, uh, in it. And we start, first started off with just process engineering. And we would add different uh, uh, disciplines or lines uh, as we moved on uh, along. Uh, and eventually, Genesis was sold to this company called uh, Acre. And Acre would actually split into two companies, um, one of which is Acre Deepwater. And that was bought up uh, by Coflexip, uh, and then uh, Coflexip was in turn bought uh, by Technip. And uh, if you're if you're here in Texas, you would have uh, you you probably be uh, familiar with uh, Technip and uh, FMC Technologies. And they actually merged back in 2016. And uh, and then uh, when they did uh, have the merger, they changed their name to Technip FMC. And then as of 2020, uh, Technip FMC decided to split into two companies again, <laughs> um, and, uh, and they, uh, uh, one side of the company decided to retain the name, and while the other uh, is called Technip Energies, and Genesis now is part of uh, Technip Energies. Um, so it kind of shows how you know uh, uh, big corporations move. Um, so if you uh, you know in the future become part of uh, such organizations. Uh, you know, please don't be surprised to see something like that happen. Um, I actually was just one month into my job when I found out that uh, my company was splitting. I had already known that uh, Technip and FMC Technologies were two different companies and had merged. Uh, you know, because they were big companies, and you know, the, they were they were they were two companies that uh, you know us students while in school used to talk about. Um, the thing was, um, since we're in here in Houston and oil and gas uh, industry is 
kind of saturated here. You know, uh, oil and gas uh, industry and oil and gas jobs is what uh, most students uh, used to talk about. Um, so we're quite aware of their history, and you know, and then I come in, and then one month later, I find out, oh, we're splitting again. So uh, it was a different experience uh, for me. It was uh, difficult seeing uh, changes as soon as I came in, uh, but uh, I, over the time, I uh, learned to adapt, and I think uh, that's something really important um, as you. Uh, uh, you know, uh, come into corporate culture to be able to adapt to different situations. Um, and here I am. Um, so if you want to move to the next slide, uh, Emily. So uh, Genesis is a multinational. Um, uh, you know, if you see on here, uh, we have a present presence all over the world um, in the Americas, uh, North and South. Uh, in Europe, uh, in uh, the Asia's, or and the uh, and in Australia as well. Um, then, if you go uh, move to the next slide, Emily. So here's uh, some of the things uh, that my department does: uh, subsea systems and controls. Uh, these are uh, some of the things that are uh, on the uh, some of the um, infrastructure. That's on the seabed um, um, near the uh, near the production site uh, and near the wells. Um, pipeline teams uh, uh, is what the pipeline team is what I am a part of. Risers are we're basically pipelines, but uh, they're pipelines that are coming in from the uh, facility uh, on the top side to uh, back down to the seabed. Um, they're Distinguished from the pipeline that's actually laid on the seabed, just because the, their uh, design and calculations are more dynamic, and we're uh, uh, the, the seabed pipelines or export lines, as I called them earlier. Their uh, design and calculations are more static. Um, and then uh, there's the geotechnical team. They actually help us uh, with soil data. Um, we need uh, soil data when we can design uh, pipelines uh, because uh, the, the, since the, uh, the pipelines are on the seabed and there's uh, you know hot uh, product flowing through the pipelines, there's a lot of uh, relaxation and uh, ex expansion, um, and so there's a lot of movement, and uh, we need to de design the pipeline for this movement. So we uh, need. Uh, the geotech team to look at the soil data and tell us, you know, what kind of friction factors we're dealing with, what kind of soil stiffness is involved, so that we can predict uh, accurately predict the movement and design uh, for that movement. Um, sometimes the uh, pipeline movement is desirable, sometimes it's not. So uh, we have to design the, uh, the pipeline accordingly. Next slide, please. Um, so, I've listed uh, some of the things that I've uh, done as a pipeline engineer so far, and uh, the bottom five bullet points are some of the other things I have not done so far, but they're also something the other pipelines engineers do. Um, so, wall thickness calculation, that is the most basic thing the pipeline does. It is to design uh, the wall thickness of a, a pipeline. Pretty simple, right? Um, so, um, we uh, there's another team that's called the flow assurance team. They uh, look at the product that's going to be flowing through the pipeline and uh, let us know what kind of uh, um, uh, diameters that we're going to be uh, re uh, requiring for the design. And uh, based off of their input, we decide uh, what kind of wall thickness we need. And the wall thickness is decided based off of uh, the uh, external pressure that, because now these pipelines, they're actually um, around 2,000 meters to 3,000 meters on this uh, seabed. And there's actually 
uh, research going on to see if we can uh, have a pipeline at even 4,000 meters. Uh, so, um, so when, when we're talking about 2,000 meters or 3,000 meters uh, of water depth, uh, the external pressure is quite significant. Um, and then uh, we have uh, internal pressure from the uh, the product that's flowing through the pipeline. So we have to design for that. We um, um, and then there is on bottom stability. Uh, what that is is to see if we can um, have the pipeline uh, sit on the seabed without you know coming uh, floating up to the surface or moving um, laterally. Uh, so in here we again uh, um, put in. Uh, uh, we might have to to design with. Um, again, we have to probably go back to wall thickness just to see if we have um, enough weight to have uh, to be uh, to allow the pipe to actually uh, sit on the seabed. Or um, sometimes, if that's not the option, we have to uh, design for stability using concrete. So we would coat the pipe with concrete and then you know lay it on the seabed. Um, cathodic protection. So um, the pipeline is on uh, 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 in the sea. So uh, obviously there's uh, uh, you know salt uh, in the seawater, and you know we have to uh, account for uh, any electrochemical re reactions from the. Uh, electrons that are in this uh, seawater from the, uh, you know, we have sodium chloride. Um, so what we do is we, there's there's different ways you can actually cathodically protect pipelines. Uh, uh, two of the common methods is to actually have metal bracelets. These uh, bracelets could be either aluminum or uh, zinc. Um, and uh, we would have these bracelets at certain distances um, so the, the cathodic protection is basically uh, uh, calculations for uh, the, the anode spacing and how much anode uh, mass of uh, the anode is to be uh, at each location. Um, another way is to actually have a uh, structure. We call it. Uh, we can call it. Uh, some people call it sled, uh, inlet sled, or ILS, um, or a plate. Um, that's actually a pipeline and termination, but uh, even though it's in the middle of the line, people sometimes just call it a plate, and they would have a uh, anode on these structures um, and connect them to the pipeline to provide uh, uh, electrochemical protection. Um, crawling and hooking, and there's uh, calculations for that as well. Uh, you know, uh, since we're in the seabed. Um, and if you're on the shallow end, uh, there's a danger of uh, trawling uh, trawls uh, or trawling ships to like you know throw their equipment down at the seabed and you know cause damage to the pipeline. So uh, we need to design for that as well. Um, lateral buckling, um, like I said um, earlier, you know we have a hot product you know flowing through the pipelines and uh, these. Temperatures are significantly high. So what happens is the obviously you know metal expands uh, uh, due to heat. So uh, now the ends, bo both ends of these pipelines, they're fixed. So now in the middle of the pipeline, as it experiences expansion, it needs to move somewhere. So uh, that ends up uh, depending on how the soils are. Uh, that sometimes uh, causes the pipeline to buckle at uh, uh, various locations and, um, so we uh, we uh, also designed the pipeline for that pipe and expansion um, so um, sometimes instead of having the pipeline completely fixed at the ends what well, uh, you know what we do is uh, we allow the pipeline to move at the end so we we uh, uh, run simulations to see how much uh, movement is taking place at and the uh, at the ends at both the ends of the pipeline, and 
uh, we put in and, uh, the plate I was talking about, pipeline end termination um, at the end, and we uh, allow the, uh, the uh, plate to move um, as the pipeline experiences expansion. Sometimes, uh, just because of the uh, the size of these pipelines, these pipelines can go up to hundreds of kilometers. So um, that translates into about you know four to uh, five meters of uh, expansion. Typically, uh, there's been cases where we uh, ran a simulation and saw about fifteen meters of um, expansion, and you know which is not desirable obviously so now we had to uh, design for the pipeline to actually buckle at certain locations on purpose uh, so that's uh, another thing that we designed um, so ladder buckling and pipeline expansion at uh, since you know I'm, I'm still pretty young in my career so I haven't uh, done uh, simulations myself uh, simulation study myself as much. But I did. Uh, I do preliminary calculations, and you know, let my seniors know that hey, I'm seeing something in here, um, and we might actually have to do an uh, do an FEA analysis and uh, do some study on this uh, expansion. Um, and uh, drafting and drawings. Uh, this is something that I did quite a bit. Uh, um, I don't do any drafting or drawing myself we have a team of drafters that does uh, that does that um, and well i just have to uh, let them know what i what kind of drawings i want and what i want to see on these drawings and i basically uh, supervise them during the whole process um, and uh, being on the project you know uh, sometimes i get a say in what kind of uh, drawings are needed sometimes the client says that you know that you know these are the drawings that they think they need and uh, we uh, obviously oblige and you know help them out with that um, and client support uh, and that is something I uh, have been doing uh, lately uh, usually uh, engineers uh, at my level uh, don't do, uh, client support or client interaction uh, as much uh, but the nature of my uh, last project actually allowed me to have some interaction with them. And um, I think that was a really good uh, experience for me. Um, fatigue analysis. Um, so uh, the pipelines are, these pipelines are usually designed for uh, about 25 to 30 years. Um, and what happens is, uh, like I said, well, the the expansion uh, and the buckling in the pipelines uh, is due to uh, the hot product that's flowing through the pipeline. But the thing is, uh, we don't have product flowing through the pipeline uh, throughout the 30 years. Um, there's actually um, cycling that takes place. You know, the the pipeline is shut off uh, uh, for different periods of time. Sometimes it's shut off for 12 hours, sometimes six, sometimes four. So uh, it's just depending, uh, depends on what uh, the, uh, the producer or the, uh, the, uh, uh, um, the company that's operating these pipelines uh, decide on. Um, so um, since the, the, uh, they're shutting off the supply, uh, obviously, uh, b because of the location of the pipelines, that you know, uh, the pipeline experiences cold temperatures, and uh, it end, uh, ends up contracting. So now you have because of these uh, cycles, now the pipeline has continuous expansion and contraction. And uh, oh, oh, uh, so now what, what's happening is now the pipeline is experiencing. Um, uh, stresses from the uh, from this contraction and expansion, not just stress from the buckling, but just stresses from uh, the movement. So now uh, uh, that obviously, you know, has, has fatigue implications on the pipeline. And uh, we, we uh, do a study to see if the pipeline will actually 
last for the uh, for its entire uh, design life. Um, I actually uh, had the opportunity to do this uh, twice so far, uh, and I think this was a great uh, learning experience for me to uh, eventually uh, take on uh, ladder buckling study uh, and uh, pipeline and expansion uh, simulations. Uh, so stress analysis, uh, span analysis. Um, I'm actually going to be doing uh, span analysis on my uh, uh, next project. Uh, so uh, it's going to be uh, a learning experience for me. Uh, I'm pretty excited for that. Um, walking is another phenomena. Uh, so uh, what that is, uh, that again goes back into uh, pipe and expansion. Um, so what happens is uh, with this uh, expansion and contraction, uh, because of the soil properties, pipeline ends up moving towards one of the ends uh, over its uh, lifetime. And what uh, what that leads to is uh, stresses on the uh, end that uh, from which the pipeline is moving away from. Uh, so we need to uh, we uh, do simulations to see how much walking is occurring, and we uh, 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 design the pipeline to either uh, buckle at, at uh, uh, desirable locations. Uh, to avoid walking, or we just design uh, the pipeline and termination depending on how much walking is taking place to uh, accommodate, you know, for the walking. Um, seismic analysis. Um, so, um, if a pipeline, uh, depending on you know uh, where uh, the pipeline uh, sometimes has to go over. Uh, bridges or ledges uh, on the seabed. You know, if you can see in this picture here, this is actually one of the projects that I first worked on when I joined. Um, so you can, if you can see in that, in that picture, uh, there's a sudden drop in the water depth and the, uh, the seabed elevation. Um, so what happens if there is a seismic activity and that uh, sudden drop um, actually uh, you know, smoothens out to a, a more uh, uh, inclined, uh, well, less, less inclined uh, slope. Um, we so you know the pipeline will suddenly you know drop on this uh, on the, on this on the seabed. So we designed if the pipeline can you know uh, actually handle such uh, seismic activities. I haven't. Uh, I I don't actually have much knowledge about this. There's only two people, uh, two or three people on our team who actually uh, look into this. Um, but obviously, uh, you know, if you're if you're going over such uh, changes in elevation, then the pipeline has to be designed for that as well. And once in a while, we also do um, an installation analysis to see. Uh, if the pipeline will actually uh, not have uh, any issues uh, as we are laying the pipeline down on the seabed, because um, uh, there's well, when the as the pipeline is being laid down on the seabed, there's significant uh, tensions uh, that are uh, being implemented on the pipeline at the seabed as well as at the vessel uh, 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 where the pipeline is you know, coming out from. Um, so we also do analysis to see if, you know, uh, if these uh, tension, uh, tensions are causing any stresses or any damage on the pipeline. Um, all right, uh, I think that's about it on my uh, engineering. Um, so some of the you know, some of these things, uh, some of these uh, uh, things, tools that I use um, in my day to day um, is uh, FEA. That that's one of the most uh, important things that we do. Um, so at work, uh, we we use uh, 
uh, Abacus, but I think uh, it's pretty common for uh, universities to use Creo Parametric, SolidWorks, and Ansys. Um, um, I think even at, uh, uh, at most people that I've, uh, I've talked to, they use either Ansys or SolidWorks. And I think uh, learning FEA is a uh, great uh, skill set to have uh, when you're out in the uh, uh, field. Um, it, uh, I think uh, having the having that skill really helps you with your job search as well. Um, so, and the other thing is uh, being familiar with industry codes. So, API, ASME, and DNV, they're some of the industry codes that we use on the regular. API stands for uh, American Petroleum Institute. ASME is obviously American Society of Mechanical Engineers. DNV is a Norwegian um, uh, industry uh, code. I'm not going to try to pronounce the uh, DNV full form. Um, so they actually provide us guidance on uh, all of those calculations and uh, um, and the uh, uh, analysis that I mentioned earlier. And then obviously there's Word, Excel, and PowerPoint. Um, Microsoft Project is another tool uh, that I, that we use. Uh, obviously, you know, there's uh, other such uh, similar tools that, that are used. In, uh, um, and then VBA and macros. <clears throat> um, we don't use VBA as much here in Houston, but um, I see that, you know, our counterparts in Europe, they're uh, pretty big on uh, Excel sheets and, you know, VBA and their macros. Um, we actually use uh, MathCAD, and a lot of our calculation is done on uh, MathCAD. We uh, we actually have calculation sheets MathCAD, uh, in MathCAD, um, <clears throat> while the uh, Europe prefers to have their uh, calculation sheets in Excel. Um, since we're uh, doing our drawing and drafting, now uh, we obviously need to be familiar with AutoCAD. Um, <clears throat> I don't use AutoCAD as much myself, uh, but some uh, it's just once in a while I might have to open up a drawing um, and uh, look at a few things here and there, but I don't do any drafting myself. Um, um, and then I've listed drawing and drafting here, um, but um, you don't, uh, in, my, my, uh, in my work, uh, as a pipeline engineer, I don't really, like I said, I don't really do drawing and drafting, but it does help to know the fundamentals of drawing and drafting uh, if you're going to be involved uh, with, uh, I, you know, uh, even with supervising uh, the drawings, uh, you know, because uh, especially as a consultant, uh, you know, when you're going to provide these drawings to your client, um, you know, you want the uh, drawings to go by the uh, the set standards. Uh, so you obviously need to be uh, aware of the rules and regulations. Um, Python is uh, something I feel like has been pretty big for a few years now. Um, uh, Python actually uh, is helping us with a lot of uh, automation. Um, and I remember a um, few months after I came in, they wanted to hire another fresh grad uh, with a background in Python just so that they, uh, you know, this person could help out with the uh, automation process. Um, quite a few uh, of uh, my uh, colleagues, they're on the older side and, uh, you know, obviously they didn't, uh, they're not uh, exposed to Python, but they're, they've uh, actively looked for people who, who have had a background in Python. Um, and uh, some of the other softwares that I am uh, using is a, is um, Stable Lines. Um, that's the software that helps me with my on bottom stability calculations. Um, uh, um, and AGA. So Stable Lines is actually a software that's been de designed uh, uh, or written rather by DNB themselves. Um, and AGA uh, is another on-bottom stability software that's uh, geared for 
uh, oil fields uh, in Gulf of Mexico. Um, um, uh, I don't know why we call it AGA. Um, AGA actually starts, uh, stands for uh, American Gas Association. Um, um, I think they were involved with the uh, development of this software, but you know the software itself, uh, I think, is just called OBS. Um, but for whatever reason, it's been a common practice to call it AGA. Um, stage profile. So uh, something I uh, forgot to mention earlier was uh, span analysis. So uh, that's something. Uh, that's another thing that I'm going to be getting into in my next project. Um, uh, so what that is, uh, due to irregularities in the uh, seabed, sometimes there are portions of the pipeline where, uh, you know, the pipeline is not resting on the seabed. It's just hanging. Uh, 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 so uh, when that happens, that uh, that actually causes uh, the pipeline uh, to be under some bending stress. So um, what we do is uh, we uh, run a simulation uh, uh, for using the soil data to see, uh, you know, uh, where we're going to have uh, uh, spans when the pipeline is laid on the seabed. And is this span going to cause uh, stresses on the pipeline? If so, uh, then we have to uh, look into some... Uh, Mitigation methods. Um, Flutter Mouse uh, is a software that actually helps us uh, in um, uh, designing the, uh, the route for the pipeline. Um, we get some uh, bathymetric data. By uh, bathymetric data, I mean uh, the seabed and you know the. Uh, um, uh, well, the geodetic data that way, where it's the uh, data that tells us what this uh, you know seabed looks like. So, uh, in scenarios where you know there's these those ledges that I was talking to you earlier about, if we uh, see some of those, uh, we use Flutter Mouse to see if we can avoid it. And in some cases, uh, we can't, and we just have to go over the ledges. And uh, in that case, then obviously you know we run our simulations to see. Uh, if that is uh, uh, feasible, because in most cases, the economical way is the most direct uh, route. Uh, so we try to do uh, have the pipeline be as direct as possible. If it turns out the pipeline can't go, uh, go uh, directly to its uh, destination, then uh, we design the pipeline to go around uh, such obstacles. Um, and sometimes uh, there is also environmental barriers. You know, there is uh, sometimes there is uh, some sort of marine life or reefs that you know need to be undisturbed. Sometimes uh, you know there is shipwrecks or debris on the uh, seabed, and it's it's just uh, you know uh, makes economic sense to sometimes just go around. Uh, debris or instead of, you know, trying to go in and move them out of the way. Um, OrcaFX is uh, a software uh, that is used for riser design. Um, me, as a pipeline engineer, I don't uh, have to use OrcaFX. Uh, we, uh, in the pipeline team, we like use OrcaFX very, very rarely. Uh, it's mainly for the riser team. Uh, they use OrcaFlex for their dynamic designs to design, you know, their risers. Um, FatFree is a software uh, that we use to uh, look at fatigue in the pipeline. Um, any, uh, any. Uh, uh, so movements are not just from the uh, contractions and expansions, but also sometimes when we have uh, spans. And there's a significant gap between the pipeline and the seabed uh, due to wave and currents. Uh, it, uh, you know, there's uh, vortices uh, that are produced around the uh, pipelines, and that causes the pipelines to vibrate. 
And obviously, there's uh, fatigue uh, induced on the pipelines due to these vibrations. So, um, uh, Pipefree is a software that helps us uh, with uh, looking at uh, all these kinds of fatigues. Um, you go to the next slide. So, I uh, just wanted to share some of the projects that I worked on so far. Um, so, Karish, that was the picture that you saw earlier uh, with the that, that that was one of the first softwares. Uh, so, one of the first projects that I worked on uh, when I came in, and I was the project was already halfway through when I came in. Um, they uh, actually got me for slowly familiar with things and uh, had me uh, slowly assimilate into the project. Um, uh, uh, this. Uh, this was a uh, uh, pipeline and right outside of Israel. Um, this this pipeline is actually about 96 kilometers long, and uh, um, oh, we we actually helped design that. Um, and um, SOB2. Um, that's these. Uh, that's another software. That, uh, another project that I worked on. Uh, SOB doesn't stand for what you think it stands for. It actually stands for uh, Son of Pluto. Uh, so the oil and gas industry can be uh, funny in that way because you know we have uh, weird names of uh, you know project fields and uh, uh, sometimes even pipelines. You know you come across a name like NHN, which stands for Nearly Headless Nick. Um, there was another thing called Mad Dog, uh, and then there's another one called Mad Cow, um, and then uh, another project that I had worked on uh, recently had uh, uh, pipelines called uh, Samurai, Alisi, Mormon. Um, um, so you you come across these you know weird. Funny names. I think that's uh, the, that was uh, pretty interesting to me. Um, so on uh, SOB two, what I did was uh, that's where I did uh, uh, fatigue analysis. So this uh, we actually had two pipelines in here uh, uh, side by side, and they each had about fifteen uh, buckles um, uh, on, uh, and um, we we did uh, analysis to see if the constant expansion contraction will actually allow the pipeline to, uh, uh, you know, last the thirty years of its life. Uh, this was an asset that was bought by Murphy from a, a company called El Log, and uh, I think the uh, lines had been in use for. Uh, Four years when they bought it, and uh, and they had uh, seen fifteen buckles, and they were obviously concerned uh, uh, to see. Uh, they wanted to see if the, the pipelines will actually last their uh, their entire design life. Uh, Americus is actually the, the project that I worked on. Uh, uh, so if you go if you go to the previous slide, Emily. So here, if you see. That's another. Uh, we call it uh, these ledges that I keep mentioning. They're actually called escarpments. So that yellow portion that you see is actually uh, 50 meters in height. So that and it's a almost a 90 degree drop. So these pipelines, they're actually not rigid pipelines. They're uh, usually we work with rigid pipelines, but these here are flexible pipelines. Um, so they can actually uh, withstand higher uh, or smaller bending radiuses um, or ADI. Um, so the company that owns these pipelines, they were concerned with the failure of this uh, uh, of this escarpment. Uh, they ran some uh, simulations based off of their soil data, and they saw that the uh, uh, quite a chunk of this escarpment is uh, the soil is actually going to flow in and uh, settle right before where the um, where you see the pipeline actually laterally curve. Um, 
and then uh, and that would actually allow the, uh, let the pipeline to um, uh, sag from uh, where uh, where the uh, pipeline actually stops uh, touching the uh, seabed. So uh, the company was concerned with the what kind of the, with any failure issues, and they wanted us to see what kind of stresses we were dealing with. And so we did a study on that, um, and, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, and we uh, got back to them. Um, if you go back to the next slide, I, uh, Beachfield is. Uh, the last project that I worked on, and this was pretty interesting to me because uh, it was uh, much different from what I had, not only what I had done so far, but uh, it was uh, different from uh, uh, from our traditional projects that we usually take on. Uh, this was a pipeline that was in use in uh, Trinidad. Um, and this was, uh, this, was uh, this is actually an onshore uh, pipeline and it was uh, and it was going through a uh, forest and the city and it had been uh, eroded and this is actually not a uh, oil and gas pipeline this was a, uh, a pipeline that was flowing uh, byproducts from uh, BP's uh, 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 processing facilities and uh, and that had led to some corrosion. Uh, over the time, and uh, well, and they wanted us to uh, come up with a solution for this. So instead of uh, uh, replacing the pipeline with another uh, metal pipeline, what we did was we actually pulled a pi plastic pipeline. We call it a liner, and we uh, uh, pulled. We actually pulled a plastic pipeline through the existing uh, metal pipeline. Uh, and this uh, this uh, pipeline was about um, uh, 13 kilometers long. Um, so there, w uh, there wasn't, uh, since uh, uh, we don't deal with uh, plastic pipelines, uh, we, uh, we, we didn't have any input on the design. As such, we were more uh, involved towards, uh, I guess you can say project management. Uh, we would uh, help BP uh, uh, interact with the uh, company that was uh, actually providing the liner, and they uh, would do the uh, engineering uh, for this pipeline. Uh, and, uh, as of uh, the, uh, earlier last month, uh, I was brought on to a new project, and this project is again in the uh, 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 it's in uh, it's in Guyana. It's a 220 kilometer pipeline. Well, uh, 220 kilometer of the pipeline is actually in uh, is offshore, and uh, 30 kilometers of it is onshore. Uh, so it's uh, it's a pretty long pipeline. Um, uh, we're just uh, in the beginning phases of it. Uh, so this is again uh, a little different from what we usually do. Um, um, because uh, usually uh, our pipelines are uh, completely offshore and only uh, the last couple uh, uh, kilometers or miles of the pipeline would actually be onshore. Uh, but this one actually has 30 kilometers. So, um, and uh, this is actually my uh, first uh, uh, big project. If you don't, if you don't count Karish. Uh, this is actually my first big project that that I've been brought on ever since I joined. Um, so I'm pretty excited for that one. Um, if you could go to the next slide, Emily. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how it was for me when I was uh, first brought on. Um, and I'm sure uh, quite a few. Uh, uh, Fresh grads, or you know, uh, or uh, students uh, who are still uh, doing the, uh, their undergrads are going to probably experience um, when you're uh, when you're first brought on, you're probably going to be idle for quite a bit, uh, and uh, it's simply because you know uh, it, it, they're they're not going to they don't expect you to know everything uh, as you come in. Uh, you know they're. Um, 
they uh, they want you to uh, get an idea of what's going on, and they will slowly bring you in on the process. So uh, for quite a while, when I came in, uh, my um, Genesis itself did not have a uh, training program. Uh, Technip FMC uh, did have one, but uh, I was actually brought on for Genesis, so I didn't go through a, a patient program or a training program as such. So when I came in, uh, at first I didn't have uh, uh, any work. They would just give me some uh, slides and some uh, reports just to read up on, that, just to get familiar with what they do. Um, and uh, and then they started giving me small tasks here and there, and then they would, uh, you know, uh, uh, see how I was doing, taking those on, and then eventually increase the difficulty. Um, <clears throat> When I came in, um, obviously, uh, you know, there was uh, a lot that I didn't know. Uh, I didn't know, uh, not just with uh, with the work, but just how, like, you know, uh, uh, things around me function. Uh, and, you know, I, I would uh, just go around asking questions, you know, to cope with that. Because... Um, you know, sometimes uh, that would, you know, get stressful. Um, but I was, you know, lucky enough to find a colleague that was, you know, always uh, willing to help me out with uh, uh, these things. And I would just go and uh, talk to him and he would help me out with these things. But in the beginning, uh, uh, not knowing anything basically was uh, difficult. Um, um and then uh, when I came in, uh, you know, I had certain expectations of what I thought I would be doing. Um, but obviously, they, they didn't uh, quite match up. Um, uh, no, go, don't get me wrong. I, uh, I like what I'm doing today. I really enjoy uh, my work. Uh, I, I find it interesting. And as I get to learn new things every day, uh, I, I enjoy it even more. But, uh, you know, uh, at first, uh, when I came in, uh, uh, I, uh, I thought I would be doing something and uh, it turned out to be completely uh, different. And at first, it was uh, 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 something that I needed to adapt to, but uh, eventually, when I was starting uh, getting, uh, started getting a hang of things and understanding what uh, what I'm doing and why a thing needs to be done in a certain way. Um, um, I was able to better manage my expectations. Um, so, um, a lot of these things, like, you know, uh, uh, when I came in, you know, uh, I was uh, coping with, uh, with them by just, you know, learning from multiple sources, you know, I would just try to go in and ga gather some old project uh, material and try to see what they did in there. I would talk to you know, people, uh, multiple people, uh, and see uh, what they're doing. And, uh, uh, you know, not just from my department, but also the other departments. Um, I try to learn from their, try to learn from their experience. Um, I would uh, form relationships with them. Uh, I think forming relationships uh, goes a long, long way. Um, because if I hadn't gone out and talked to people, I probably wouldn't have been on a project for uh, months, probably. Because, uh, you know, if someone, if, if a project manager doesn't know you, if he doesn't, if they don't know that you exist, <laughs> they're not going to uh, uh, push you on a project. And if you don't, uh, if you're not on a project, then, you know, you're not, you're never going to get that uh, exposure. Um, um, so, so I think, uh, uh, forming relationships and, and not just with, uh, you know, getting uh, work exposure, but so, uh, I think forming relationships, uh, and goes, uh, a long way with, uh, uh, the other uh, aspects as well. Um, and always like, you know, keep, your ears open, uh, you know, keep, uh, listen to what's going on around you. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, 
try to analyze and see, you know, how uh, uh, things might affect you and, you know, uh, how they might uh, affect your work that you're doing, uh, how you might be uh, able to contribute and uh, use those things as uh, those things to your advantage. Um, starting on, I think it would, uh, it's always uh, good to like, you know, get, you uh, get a second opinion on how you, uh, on your work uh, you know just let a you know if you if you, if you have a senior who's able to like you know uh, if, who you are able to approach ask them you know uh, like hey I have this calculation this way because I thought you know uh, it might actually be beneficial uh, in this other way whatever right and uh, see what they say and you know uh, before you uh, you know you turn in your work, um, talk to them, and discuss your uh, and discuss your work with them. Um, they uh, your seniors they always have uh, invaluable uh, information. Uh, we just have to go and speak to them. Um, and like I said uh, earlier, I think uh, I I saw quite quite a bit of changes when I was. There, like I said, when the company split and announced that they were going to split into two, uh, literally one month after I joined in, and then a few months down the line, I saw that uh, you know we had the pandemic come in. Come in. Um, so there was quite a uh, quite a bit to like you know uh, adapt to. Uh, so I would you know go and uh, talk to others and see how they're uh, coping up uh, with. The situ whatever situation we're in, and you know, I would ask them uh, 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 their opinion on how to tackle such situations, and I think that helped me out a lot. Um, another thing that you could do is uh, set goals. Um, so um, after setting idle for for a while. Um, I, uh, what I did was I, I decided, okay, you know what, um, they're not going to give me, uh, they're, they're not going to bring me on, uh, onto projects if they're not confident about my capability. So I need to like, you know, get familiar with the different kinds of, uh, uh calculations, uh, uh, that we do. And, uh, I set a goal that, okay, uh, by the end of this year, I would want, I want to get familiar with, uh, all of these things, and I would uh, pursue the, uh, uh, my uh, the, uh, my uh, goal of you know basically getting familiar with thing, with these things. Um, so I uh, I think that uh, uh, came uh, helped me out. I would like you know let my seniors know, hey, um, that uh, uh, in the next couple of months uh, uh, I'm gonna you know. Uh, Take some time to like you know get, uh, learn uh, these uh, softwares or these calculations, and then uh, I'm gonna try to uh, 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 implement them on some uh, previously uh, previous project. You know, like you know uh, some calculation that's been already done on a project. So, and then I would try to replicate that. So, and I, I would uh, bring them on my uh, you know. Uh, learning procedure and show them, okay, this is what I did. And, you know, obviously I get feedback from them and, uh, and I would gain their, uh, confidence like that. Uh, I think that's, uh, uh that was like really helpful for, for me to, uh, do. Um, <clears throat> you want to go to the next slide? Um, so this slide is a little more for, uh, uh, fresh grads and uh, students who are still in school. Um, so obviously, uh, your resume is the first thing you need uh, when you uh, apply for a job. But uh, I want to point out that um, that you want to start building your resume as soon as you can. Um, you don't build a resume overnight. Um, I was, uh, when I was part of my student organization back in, uh, in my undergrad days, um, even though we were called Society of Manufacturing Engineers, we were more geared towards helping students out with their professional development. 
we will uh, bring in you know guest speakers and uh, uh, HR representatives to you know give their uh, uh, in, uh, their um, input on how, how to build resumes. They would also talk to us about uh, what's going on uh, in the industry. Um, so there would be times when a, a student would come in and tell us that uh, they don't have a resume yet. And uh, they plan on uh, uh, building, uh, starting their resume in their final uh, year of study because uh, that's when they're going to probably start searching for a job. Um, and I've also seen uh, instances where this person uh, uh, built a resume overnight and applied for a job, and they were surprised that uh, they didn't get it, even though. Uh, you know, they had a relationship with the person who encouraged them to apply to the company. Um, yeah, the resumes, uh, like I said, again, like they need to be uh, built uh, and, and developed over years. Uh, you need to get input from multiple people. If, you're, if your uh, draft has been looked at by 10 to 15 people, then it's only looked by a lesser number of people. Um, so I would recommend uh, building your resume and ha asking multiple uh, people to take a look at it. Even if you're in your first year of uh, undergraduate studies or your second year of undergraduate studies, get that resume started and then uh, update it as you move along. Um, and when you're uh, putting in uh, your job app, uh, when you're applying for jobs, uh, you put in a lot of time and effort, I feel like. Uh, sure, yeah, sometimes you might get lucky and, uh, you know, get hired with a uh, minimum uh, amount of efforts. Uh, you know, there's, there's instances when you uh, get hired from right out of college. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I feel like... Uh, for engineers, uh, finding a, a job isn't always easy. Uh, I think uh, uh, when I was uh, doing my job search, I actually uh, uh, was pretty disciplined. You know, I would uh, actually uh, wake up in the morning and um, from uh, eight to about uh, one p.m. I would just uh, contact people on uh, LinkedIn. So I would actually apply to uh, jobs uh, at uh, from like 7 to like 11 in the night. Um, and then in the morning, I would wake up and, you know, I would contact people from uh, uh, the companies from last night, um, uh, the HR or the directors or VPs. I would just, you know, try to connect with them on uh, LinkedIn and tell them, hey, um, I applied for this job yesterday and I was wondering if uh, there's anything more I could do to, you know, up my application process. Um, <clears throat> I would do about 60, 70 uh, uh, requests every day. And, you know, about like 10 people would actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, connect with me. And even out of that 10 people, only two would probably, uh, you know, re respond back to me. Um, so, but then I did this for uh, about two, three months, maybe. So, um, uh, you know, uh, and that's where, like, you know, uh, my the, the uh, that's the amount of time and effort that I put in, you know. And um, another thing that you need to have is some patience. Uh, you know, when I uh graduated you know like um uh, i saw like you know quite a few quite a few of my friends had uh jobs on hand uh before they graduated and you know i, I was kind of stressed out and worried that I, I might not get a job uh because i despite putting in so much effort um being in a student organization i had uh, uh exposure to uh, you know, people from the, uh, from uh, quite a lot of people from the uh, uh, industry, you know, and um, uh, even though it did help me get interviews, 
um, I didn't, I had not uh, landed a job. And, uh, you know, uh, as a couple of months had passed, I was, you know, low on confidence. Um, uh, and I was feeling a little uh, stressed out. Um, but, uh, like I said, you know, uh, 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 getting a job for engineers is not always easy. Especially, you know, during the pandemic, I'm sure quite a few of you must have seen that, uh, you know, uh, well, finding a job was the most difficult thing ever. Um, I know uh, quite a lot of my friends who graduated during the uh, pandemic, they, uh, they were not able to find jobs. And I think there was uh, two or three semesters uh, of, you know, uh, students who like you know uh, graduated uh, who came out of university and, and were just uh, looking for jobs um, you know uh, the companies did not want to hire like my company in fact uh, as the pandemic set in they actually went on uh, a hiring freeze as they were seeing uh, 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 as they were seeing the you know the number of projects uh, slowing down um, so, um, you know, just have the patience and keep like, you know, working on your applications. Uh, you know, it might end up taking long, uh, longer than you, uh, uh, anticipated, but, uh, uh, once, you know, things get better, I'm, I'm sure you'll land a job. Um, but while you're, you know, working on your, uh, uh, job search, um, it would always obviously be good to like, you know, sharpen your skills. Um, you know, uh, uh, maybe work on your, uh, FE exam, the fundamentals of engineering exam. Uh, I, I, when I was doing my job search, I saw, uh, quite a few companies out there when they were looking for, uh, graduate, uh, uh, fresh grads, they actually listed, uh, uh, EIT as one of the requirements. So while you're doing your job search, maybe one of, that's one of the things that you could, uh, pick on. I also had a uh, green belt in Six Sigma, so uh, I actually was also applying to manufacturing engineering jobs. So and uh, knowledge in lean uh, uh, manufacturing methods and uh, having a Six Sigma belt as a green belt was uh, uh, another uh, two of the requirements that were uh, that was that were listed by uh, people, uh, uh, companies hiring uh, manufacturing engineers. So, you know, uh, you can, you know, sharpen your skills, you know, if you, there's a certain, uh, software that your university taught you, um, uh, you can, uh, go in and use that. I think, like I said earlier, FEA was, uh, I think, uh, a lot, many mechanical engineering jo uh, jobs use. And, you know, if, uh, uh, you have access to software, then you can probably go back and try to brush up on, uh, how to use the software and how to apply your engineering so, uh, knowledge on that software. Uh, practicing interviews. I think this is a big one. People don't do this as often as I would, uh, would uh, like them to. Um, and I think this goes both ways. Uh, I think the person who is going for the interview, as well as the person who is going to conduct the interview, both um, should actually uh, practice uh, the interview itself. Um, I had a, uh, weird experience. This was, there was this company that I really, really wanted to, uh, work with. Uh, they were, a, a company that manufactured, uh, heavy equipment. Um, and, uh, it was a phone call and, uh, and there was going to, there were going to be five people on this call and none of them had rehearsed and then uh, seen, you know, uh, or looked at my resume and didn't know what questions they wanted to ask me. And when I, during the call, it was, it was a lot of awkward silence and which made it awkward for me as well. And I, you know, I, I ended up being uncomfortable. And needless to say, the interview was a complete disaster and I ended up not getting the job. Um, so it was a mistake on, I guess, both our ends, um, you know, um, so I think if you, uh, 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 actually practice your response, 
um, it will help you with your uh, thing. Uh, and there's uh, literally 15 questions that uh, that they can actually ask you in your um, interview. And all other questions are just variations of these 15 questions just asked in a you know different way. Um, so I would suggest, you know, writing down these questions. You can find them online. That's what I did. I actually went online on the questions and I uh, drafted my response uh, to these questions and actually had uh, people look at the, uh, these uh, these answers and, uh, you know, uh, give me their advice on uh, uh, on these answers. Um, so uh, I think that is a really important thing that people should do. Um, and obviously, uh, another thing that you know many people say is uh, uh, research the company uh, that you're going uh, to the interview for. But here, what I'm trying to uh, say is also research uh, different kinds of companies. Um, for example, uh, uh, research uh, the medical sector. You know how. Uh, if you're a mechanical engineer, how would you fit in the medical sector? You know, uh, how can you position yourself as an employee with them? Um, um, I was, uh, when I first heard, you know, by, this was back in uh, undergrad, and there was actually a classmate of mine who was uh, working as a mechanical engineer in the medical sector. And when I first heard that, it was very surprising to me. But then um, he went on to explain uh and tell me what he uh, what is it that he actually did, and he told me, okay, like you know, I actually uh, design equipment uh, that you know doctors use uh, uh, during surgeries. Um, and when he actually told me uh, what he did, I, I found that interesting. So, um, don't be uh, confined to just what you're familiar with. Go online, see, uh, uh, see what you know. Uh, the different things a mechanical engineer, or not just mechanical engineers. If, even if you're an electrical engineer or a civil engineer, go online and see, you know, what you can, uh, uh, what your field of study can, uh, you know, position you as uh, in that kind of, uh, in that company. Um, the geotech team that I mentioned earlier. Uh, they're actually uh, uh, full of uh, civil engineers, um, and when you hear the uh, when I heard uh, the term geotech, I thought that was a specific line of study, and um, uh, I thought that was a very specific uh, uh, degree, and that might something that's that might be something that's offered in a few universities that I might not be familiar with, but then. When I, uh, you know, uh, talk to people from their team, I realize, okay, they're all civil engineers. And in my, uh, in my uh, uh, team, uh, I'm, there's, there's actually uh, civil engineers as well. And there's actually an uh, engineer who took up uh, marine engineering. Uh, there's another one who took up ocean engineering. I don't know what that uh, uh, that is, but uh, we have uh, we basically have uh, uh, people from various engineering backgrounds in our pipeline team, um, and be uh, another advice that I would give you is be open to uh, different uh, jobs and uh, and companies. Uh, uh, just because you know you're a mechanical engineer or an electrical engineer, it doesn't mean you know that you would just do that. Um, uh, when you went to university, uh, you know uh, the, the purpose of that was you know to actually learn by uh, mechanical engineering or whatever field of study that you had picked. Um, Sometimes people tend to forget that. They think, oh, um, just because I did mechanical engineering, that's all I'm going to do. Um, you can actually use that knowledge to leverage that 
uh, for uh, different uh, uh, different kind of work. Um, I know there's uh, so many people who've actually uh, studied mechanical engineering and uh, started their business and used this uh, their knowledge in mechanical engineering to start business. There's uh, people who uh, 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 took up uh, mechanical engineering and did uh, their did a specialization in uh, you know, HVAC and uh, you know started a a startup. So you know, uh, be open to like you know different opportunities. Uh, uh, um, you know, go online and obviously there's there's a whole uh, there's a lot of material uh, online that you can actually look up and uh, see what your knowledge can actually get you into. Um, uh, to me, uh, when I was in the uh, student organization, um, you know, I used to uh, being in Houston and you know be, having a lot of oil and gas companies around. Uh, you know, we used to only talk about. Uh, you know, all these oil and gas companies, you know, everyone used to talk about uh, getting in the oil and gas. Um, and to me, I thought that, you know, that was, you were you were limiting yourself when you were just doing that, only thinking about oil and gas. I used to, uh, as a officer in a student organization, I uh, always made an attempt to bring in um, uh, companies from uh, different industries. I actually... Uh, contacted uh, Caterpillar and Komatsu uh, to see if they would come down and uh, speak to us. Um, I had uh, worked at Daikin one summer and uh, I was able to get them to come in and uh, talk to us and, you know, uh, uh, tell us, you know, speak to us about the different uh, job opportunities that are available to students from our uh, program. Uh, so, you know, um, um, and then I actually had uh, talked to Boeing at one point. Um, unfortunately, they were they were not able to come in. Um, you know, so basically, uh, what I'm saying is, you know, be open to uh, different opportunities. Um, um, I'm sure uh, uh, this might be something that's you know uh, a thing in. Uh, different cities as well, you know, just because there's a prevalence of like, you know, uh, 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 certain kind of industry or just a, a certain uh, group of companies doing the same thing uh, in that city, you know, you might uh, tend to lean towards that. But uh, always be, I would suggest that, you know, always be open to different opportunities. Um, networking events, um, I think, uh, uh, these are uh, really, really helpful. Um, um, so, well, being uh, 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 part of the student organization, I was uh, conduct. I was helping in organizing uh, organizing such uh, events, and um, you know, uh, I think that would. Uh, when I, even before, like, you know, I, when I was just a member of, of the student organization, I would come and, you know, after their meeting, I would just like to have a one-on-one -on -one with the speaker and, you know, ask, uh, ask them, okay, like, what would it, uh, what is the requirement? Like, if I, uh, the speaker would have, you know, told us, uh, talk to us and told us, okay, this is the kind of jobs that we have in our company. Uh, and these are the kind of jobs that uh, you guys from your program come uh, uh, mm -hmm. come into. Um, and then I would go up to them and ask them, okay, like, uh, well, uh, how, what can I uh, do, like, uh, to better my chances of getting that job? And then, you know, I would talk to them, hand them my resume, um, and then, you know, uh, connect them, with, uh, connect with them on LinkedIn. And try to keep in touch with them. Um, and then I did the same when I uh, became an officer. And then you know, uh, uh, and uh, but really, when I would uh, when I became an officer, I would actually um, talk to them more about my organization than myself. And I would 
really put them uh, put myself out there with without really putting myself out there and i th i thought uh, i think that really impresses uh, people from um, hr i think uh, they see that as a leadership quality and uh, um, and uh, that actually puts you in a very good position and i that actually landed me I would say about four or five interviews uh, just being part of a, a student organization, um, and then uh, there's obviously events that are that might be taking place in your city. Uh, one of the most, uh, uh, one of the biggest uh, events that takes takes place here in Houston is the Offshore Technology Conference. Uh, you know, uh, where uh, a whole bunch of these oil and gas companies get together. Um, so I would uh, print out a, uh, a whole bunch of my uh, uh, copy, uh, a whole bunch of copies of my resume, and I would uh, take them uh, to the conference and actually treat this conference as a career fair, and go out to all of these companies and uh, hand out my resumes, talk to different people over there. Um, and I think uh, even being at this uh, uh, conference. Uh, you know, landed me a couple of conferences and landed me a couple of a uh, couple interviews. Um, <clears throat> um, but really, I uh, what uh, in the end, what got me in my job was uh, I feel like was LinkedIn. Um, so, uh, like I said, uh, like I told you about my routine, you know, I would apply to uh, different jobs at night, and I found this uh, opening on. Uh, indeed, and I would uh, I applied for that uh, uh, for that job, and then uh, next day I uh, uh, contacted uh, all these HR people and uh, people uh, who were uh, you know uh, position in position of uh, uh, decision making, and you know I would tell them, hey, I applied for this job, and you know, I was hoping. Uh, if you could let me know if, I, if there's anything else I could do to help my uh, application. Um, and uh, I think two days from after that, uh, I get an email from this uh, lady who was actually in California uh, telling me that, you know, she's uh, uh, interested in me for a job in Houston. And uh, you know, they asked me what my salary expectation was and, you know, if I... Um, was a uh, if I if I needed sponsorship, and then uh, um, they uh, once I again responded to them, they set, set up a time for my interview. Um, um, so and I, I think another uh, 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 I think I, I had another two uh, interviews that I got from uh, actually just contacting people from. Uh, LinkedIn, even that, that, that uh, job that I was talking to you about with, with uh, uh, heavy machinery, um, I had uh, contacted all of their HR representatives and none of them uh, uh, responded back. But uh, the person who did get back to me was actually a uh, VP and uh, he thought my resume was pretty Im impressive. And uh, he he contacted the HR himself to actually uh, speak with me and set up the interview. Um, and uh, there was this another company who actually manufacturing uh, who manufactures valves. Um, uh, uh, they uh, actually got back to me through LinkedIn as well. So I think uh, LinkedIn is a really really uh, uh, good tool. Uh, to help you with your job search, just uh, make sure that you have a strong profile. Make sure uh, you know you have someone look at it just the same way you would have someone you know look at your uh, resume uh, and give you their uh, feedback on it. Um, <clears throat> um, and uh, yeah, when you uh, go out for the uh, um, uh, networking events. Make sure the person that you speak with, um, that uh, you know, you at the end, the end, at the end of this conversation, make sure that you actually connect with them on LinkedIn and 
um, next day maybe or two days down the line, just follow ups, tell them, hey, um, uh, I uh, remember, uh, I hope you remember me from the networking event. We had a conversation. I handed out my resume to you. Uh, I was, uh, I applied to th uh, this job position. I was wondering if there was, you know, if there's something we can do, you know? So I think uh, uh, that goes a long way for your job search. Um, yeah, I think uh, that's about it for this slide. Um, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to take them. So uh, we did get, um, I think, at least one question in the uh, text chat while we were going. Um, mm -hmm. Chase asked, do you use multiple FEA software packages on the same project? You, uh, For example, you listed Creo, SolidWorks, and ANSYS. Um, and if so, what's the benefit? Um, no. So, uh, um, I listed that uh, the three uh, of those because uh, that was something our professor back in uh, when I was under, in undergrad, he would have, have us do. He would actually uh, have us solve uh, each problem in uh, all, all of these software. But um, uh, over here at work, we only uh, tend to use Abacus um, and going in. Um, uh, we make an agreement with the client. We tell them, hey, this is the software um, that we're using for this analysis. Um, uh, and then we, we tell them um, how we're going to build the model and uh, lay out our design methodology and get them to agree on it. Um, I would say uh, Sage, is, Sage is also considered an FEA software. Um, but um, uh, the, uh, well, Abacus and Sage, uh, the way they do uh, the, the, their uh, methodologies of uh, how they do, they perform their calculations is different. Um, and we don't use uh, Sage uh, like we use Abacus. Uh, we really use Sage just for uh, our span and uh, span analysis there's a before we even get to span analysis we actually have a process called on bottom roughness um, that is the step where we predict uh, the number of spans that we're going to have and we uh, predict uh, the characteristics of each of these spans you know the, the, the distance between the the pipeline and the seabed uh, the length of each of these spans we predict that and then we uh, we put it in, uh, we, uh, we uh, uh, do calculations to see if there's going to be stresses or any fatigues in these spans. Um, I guess if you ask any benefit uh, in using, we don't, like, like I said, we don't typically use multiple uh, FEA software, but I guess the benefit would be uh, to see, um, look at the accuracy and the precision of uh, the, re the results that we're producing um, and when we uh, use uh, different software. And that's literally why a uh, professor used to have us use uh, different uh, uh, software uh, when we were back in uh, undergrad. All right. Cases, thank you for clarifying that. And also has another question. Did you specifically? Specifically, job search in the oil and gas industry, or were you considering other fields? I think you talked <laughs> about that a little bit uh, earlier. Yeah. Um, so, uh, honestly speaking, uh, when I first started off, uh, I did not want to get into the oil and gas industry. Uh, uh, just because I was aware of uh, the uh, I was aware of the uh, ups and downs, you know, uh, you know, the instability that the oil and gas industry offers. Um, sure, I know we all, uh, oil and gas is known for their um, payment, uh, like the salary, uh, like high high salary packages and stuff. But um, 
what are you going to do with your uh, big salary packages if you uh, don't have a job? So that kind of like scared me, but it's just, you know, uh, I wanted to stay in Houston. Um, so, you know, and um, oil and gas was what was like, you know, really uh, the option, I guess, for me. I did apply to uh, uh, HVAC. I applied to manu I, quite a lot of uh, the uh, manufacturing companies. Um, I did not uh, in any way limit myself to Houston. I did apply to, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, companies uh, in different cities in different states. Um, I actually even applied to some companies in Canada. Uh, but uh, it, it wasn't like, you know, I had uh, a whole bunch of uh, uh, jobs lined up. Sure, yeah, like, you know, I was interviewing with uh, quite a few companies. Um, but, you know, it wasn't that I had a job in hand yet. So I was still applying, trying to... Uh, see uh, what I get, and then I was going to uh, go from there. Uh, but yeah, it just so happened that uh, I ended up in the oil and gas. I do like what I'm doing right now. Um, I, I think all of uh, everything that, that I do every day is pretty interesting to me. Um, uh, but yeah, I did apply to a whole bunch. I, uh, I would suggest that to everyone, like, you know, please do not limit yourself uh, 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 be open to different kinds of opportunities. See, uh, try and uh, find out what uh, what is out there for you. You know. All right, we got another question um, from Saku L. They ask, "How do you know who to message on LinkedIn after applying for a job?" Um. So. You don't. <laughs> so uh, uh, what I did was, uh, for example, uh, Technip FMC is the parent company of Genesis, right? So I would, uh, after apply, uh, one, uh, the application that I got uh, found on Indeed was actually from Technip FMC. So after I had turned in uh, the application, and mind you, I did not, when I uh, did my application, I did not just apply to this one position. I applied to multiple. Um, I think for technique preference, I applied to like six. I, um, and then uh, in the morning, I would go to technique FMC's uh, uh, um, LinkedIn page, and then I would find, go to their people's tab, and then I would, below their names, you would find it, their uh, job. I would just uh, look at every uh, HR representative, um, any directors, any VPs, and I would uh, try to connect with them. And like I said, like um, I would send at least at least uh, sixty connection requests uh, in a day, and like ten would probably actually respond to those. Um, um, and you don't really know if where these people are. Um, uh, and like uh, again, like I said, uh, the person who contacted me. Uh, was actually in uh, California, but she contacted me for a job in Houston. So don't, again, I wouldn't, uh, don't limit yourself to uh, who you connect with on LinkedIn. Uh, you don't know how they're connected to, regardless of uh, how they're connected to where you want your job, regardless of where they're sitting. So, uh, uh, and, you know, just go out and, uh, don't worry about, you know, uh, any rejections or don't worry about, you know, not getting a response. Uh, if you don't uh, uh, can try to connect with people, uh, you're not even going to uh, be able to get in touch with them. So um, just go on and uh, put in those requests. Great. That was great. Thank you. Um, another kind of related question. How should we get to know and or get used to the work culture in companies? What should we avoid and what would you advise on doing to get well-known as a capable and reliable person in the workplace? Um, yeah, so um, 
like uh, I think I covered this a little bit earlier. Um, go out and try to uh, talk to people. Um, so first, I actually started off with uh, the person who sat uh, in the cubicle adjacent, adjacent to me. Um, uh, he probably got annoyed <laughs> with the amount of questions that I would have for him. Um, like, you know, my manager actually started off with, uh, with some, um, he, he provided with me, me with some uh, slides that I could, you know, read up on. So I would just read some on, uh, some, up on some of the materials and, you know, whenever, um, I actually first waited for him, him to first talk to me. Uh, and then when he, uh, when he first did, you know, uh, uh, I would ask him questions and eventually like, you know, once I, um, uh, had that relationship with him, I would just like, you know, pop up my head over the wall and then just, you know, ask him, Hey, do you have a minute? I have this question. Um, and then, uh, at first, you know, it, it started out with just asking uh, uh, him about, like, you know, uh, work-related stuff. And then uh, that mo moved into, like, you know, company culture and, you know, hey, uh, you know, the, there's this thing uh, that I'm doing, but I'm not sure what the procedure is. Uh, could you help me out? And then, you know, uh, he would help me out. Um, um, I was lucky enough to have a couple of couple, uh, interns that had joined with me. Um, I, I had come in as a full-time engineer, uh, engineer, but like there was a couple, there were a couple uh, interns who came with me. So we were kind of in the same boat. So, uh, you know, trying to get familiar with things. So like, you know, we would just talk to each other and be like, Hey, uh, uh, you know, my manager asked me to do this. Uh, uh, do you know, are you familiar with this thing? And then, you know, um, obviously, you know, half the time they didn't know what I was doing, but, you know, they're, they're, there's been a couple of times where they were able to, like, you know, help me out. Um, and then I would slowly uh, expand to, you know, uh, people who um, were um, in, uh, who were at a distance from me, just like walking by and stuff. Uh, if I was in the cafeteria, you know, you know, just, uh, you know, getting food or whatever, like, you know, I would, um, uh, just walk up to them and be like, Hey, uh, I saw you, uh, in the cubicle nearby. Uh, I'm actually a new engineer here. Uh, you know, just introduce yourself, you know, and then ask them what they do. Uh, and then, uh, you know, just as you're walking by and say hi, hello, form that relationship. And then, you know, as you build that relationship, you, you know, it makes it easier for you to go up to them and, uh, uh, ask them questions. Um, and, uh, and they, um, uh, as you do that, they will, you know, you'll, you'll, as you talk to them, you'll uh, become familiar with, uh, the company culture. All right. Um, we have a question. Uh, how relevant or important is the PE license to your job or your industry overall? Um, so, um, speaking with the uh, people that I work, it seems that it's uh, pretty important. Um, um, first of all, uh, like, you know, I think everyone, uh, maybe a handful of people are uh, at work actually don't have their PE license, but uh, everyone around me seems to be uh, pretty qualified. A whole bunch of them have uh, PhDs uh, or masters at the least. Um, I think I can only count like four people that I know of that don't have uh, their PE licenses. Um, and I actually uh, heard from someone uh, this one time that um, um, so apart from the resumes that we built for, uh, our, uh, job for my job search, um, my company actually had me build a internal resume where I would, you know, uh, list down all the project projects that I've been on and, you know, everything that I did on these projects. And they would use these resumes to, uh, bid for projects, you know, uh, and they put my, they put my resume in, in the portfolio. And let the client know that this is the this is one of the engineers that's going to work on this project. Um, so obviously that 
resume uh, does uh, get circulated a little bit. And this person who, who I was talking to told me that uh, every year when they were uh, like, you know, uh, dating the resume, they uh, after they got their PE license, they put that in there. And uh, that somehow made it to their uh, to to the HR department, and um, without him actually asking for it, they gave him a uh, a salary bump and uh, a uh, new title, a new job uh, title. Uh, they pushed him to I think uh, senior engineer. So I guess at my uh, at my company, pretty uh, getting a PE license uh, does do you pretty good. Well, I think that was the last question we had. Um, I wanted to take time and thank you for actually, you know, putting this presentation together and, you know, sharing your experience with us. Um, uh, I know I come from a completely different industry, so everything that you've been talking about is totally new for me. Um, so uh, again, thank you for on behalf of uh, the Discord channel in general and everybody who's listening in. We we really do appreciate you taking time out of your weekend to you know share your journey with us. Um, and uh, if you have any more uh, any last things to add, I think uh, we'll uh, wrap up. Uh, no, no um, well, I want to thank you guys for uh, doing the work that you guys did. Um, um uh i think uh i don't know everyone's name on here uh, uh cam emily uh chase tiffany uh, some of the uh, people that i've talked to her i think you guys are doing great work here uh connecting people and you know uh, you know uh putting uh uh this this is actually a great resource out there uh for, for people um the this discord group um so uh you know Keep up the good work, uh, and I'm, uh, I, I, I really appreciate that you guys are doing this. All right, thank you. Chase, do you have anything to add, or are we uh, good to wrap up? No, I think we're good to wrap up. Um, you know, Thank you again, everyone else, for coming today, and uh, don't forget we have Resumania next week if you want to touch up your resume. Yep, I'm always... Uh, always available for Resmania every Fridays until the end of time. Yeah. And um, if anyone has any more questions, uh, you know, they can obviously uh, reach out to me on text. Um, I would be willing to answer any more questions uh, um, if they want uh, uh, any advice on uh, resume or uh, oil and gas industry or the work that I do. Uh, yeah, sure, you can like uh, reach out to me. All right. Um, sounds like uh, we'll end there. Thank you, everyone, for joining in, and uh, we'll see you next time.